Welcome and good afternoon in Rochester. Good evening, uh, good morning, wherever you are around the world. We're glad to see you today on this webinar to talk a little bit about living on campus at the University of Rochester. My name is Dan Watts. I am the interim executive director of residential life and housing services at the university. I've been at the University of Rochester in a variety of capacities for 28 years. So I have lots of background information about this wonderful place and what it's like to, uh, to be here and to be a student here and to be a member of the community. I've got a couple of my colleagues joining us today and I'll ask them to introduce themselves. Ashlyn. Hi everyone, my name is Ashlyn Hudson and I am an area coordinator here at the University of Rochester. Um, I oversee a couple of our different communities, but one of those does include Lovejoy Hall, which is one of our first year buildings. So I look forward to hopefully seeing some of you next year living in Lovejoy. All right, Julianne. Hi everyone, um, I'm Julianne Schnibby. I'm one of the associate directors for ResLife. Um, my six year anniversary is this Monday uh, and I first served as an area coordinator here. Um, and so like Ashlyn, I oversee uh, a lot of the upper class areas, but Lovejoy is underneath our umbrella as well. And so hopefully we'll see some of you around. Great. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. We do have a slideshow that we're gonna use today. Julianne is going to be monitoring the chat for questions. So by all means, any questions you have, throw them in the chat. If they're pretty simple and straightforward, we may just answer them in the chat or bring them to the whole group and discuss. So here goes my screen share. So at the University of Rochester, about 4,300 students live on campus. And you can see by the numbers, about 80% of our students do live on campus. In the first and second year, there is a mandatory on-campus housing requirement. So almost all of our first year and sophomore students do live on campus. In the junior and senior year, more and more students do choose to live off campus. So we have about 70 some percent, 78 percent of our juniors live on campus and about 65 or 68 percent of our seniors live on campus. So that varies across the years and it includes students who are studying abroad, but about 80 percent of our students do live on campus at any one time. Students do live, first year students do live in the first year quad, which uh, last year we added Lovejoy Hall, which if you can see my cursor is right here. Uh, I'm not smart enough to know how to update this slide to color Lovejoy blue, but about half of the class will live right here in Lovejoy Hall, uh, Hoeing Hall, Gilbert Hall, and Tiernan Hall. This is the first year quad. The other half of the class will live here in the first year hill. This is Susan B. Anthony Hall and Genesee Hall. Here's a brief video and they're going to show you some rooms, which I know is what you came here to see. Life at the University of Rochester begins in the residence halls. More than 4,340 of our students live in the nine undergraduate areas we have here. Besides convenience, there are plenty of reasons to live on campus. Studies show that students who live in on-campus housing have higher GPAs and greater satisfaction with their college experience. Convenience, support, and leadership opportunities are all great reasons to live on campus, but we know what you're really here for, the rooms. Most rooms are doubles, which means you have two beds, two desks, two chairs, two dressers, and two closets. Now some halls have triples or even singles. In that case, we just adjust the furniture. Every hall is unique, so rooms, types, configurations, and dimensions differ. While the rooms are a big piece, you may be interested in some other areas of the hall. Like the community bathrooms. They're pretty standard, but they're cleaned for you, which is one less thing you have to worry about. Another thing you don't have to worry about, laundry facilities, because every hall has one, and it's free. Our halls also have study areas, community lounges, and kitchens, and some halls even have other amenities. Living on campus, you'll be surrounded by people who want to help you succeed. We have resident directors, GHRs, and RAs, whose job is to create living communities in each hall. We also have fellows and alliance. They also live in the hall. Their job is to help you feel supported with academics and also get you involved on campus. We also have maintenance, custodial, and res life staff who are here to keep the place running and clean. And lastly, since safety and security are a big part of our residential halls, we have a public safety liaison who is centered in every campus hall. 
Like I said before, you all residential life is all about you and your success. There's something for everyone in our first year areas, so let's check them out a little more in depth. Welcome to the first year hill, including Genesee and Susan B. Anthony Halls. The hill is the largest first year area on campus, housing about 800 students. This big, friendly community is located near Rush Trees Library. Danforth Dining Center and Hillside Market are inside, so let's go check it out. Hello everyone, my name is Peter and I'm an RA for the first year hill, so we're going to show you guys the sous vide room really quick. So you have pretty much two of everything. You have two beds and mattresses, two closets right over there behind us, two dressers, and then two chairs and desks. It's something that's specific to Susan B. Anthony are the accent wall. So every room comes with its own accent wall, which looks kind of nice so you don't have just the white on white on white. Right over here on the desks, we have this little hutch up here that has a light so you can actually do studying in your own room without bothering your roommate and also not having to worry about going over to the library. The beds um, allow for different ways of personalizing your room. So you can do a couple different heights. This is gonna be the tallest height other than lofting. And this is what they come with when you guys move in. We're gonna take a look at a Genesee room really quick. So this is basically comparable in size to most of the um, first year rooms that we have on campus. This one's gonna be a little bit longer as opposed to the ones in Subi, which we've seen, which are a little bit deeper. Some other spaces on the hill include the Sue B. Renia Room, a great lounge with games and TV, the seventh floor solarium with a great view of rush trees, and a kitchen on every floor. Welcome to the first year quad, including Gilbert, Hoeing, and Tiernan Halls. This traditional style area houses about 720 first year students. The quad is located in the collegiate residential quad, close to Wilson Commons and Douglas Dining Center. The quad has a great community feel and the heart of campus activities, so let's check it out. Hello, my name is Srihar Chari. I'm standing here on the first year quad in Hoeing Hall, and I'm here to show you a double size room. These rooms are pretty unique because there's a lot of room in the center. I recommend pushing everything to the walls you'll have a nice space to hang out with friends. When you move into your first year dorm, your beds come at a level three height. This is the tallest height a bed can be, unless you loft it. It fits perfectly one of these dressers right underneath that frees up some space in your room. You have a hutch right here along the desk. The hutch is really useful because it contains a small little outlet that you can use to charge your phone, your computer, anything musical, um, and you have a nice chair that rocks back a little bit. So on the walls, um, it's pretty easy to decorate the dorm room. Um, put up whatever you'd like, as long as it's not a fire hazard, um, and you can use this rack on the top to pin different um, items that you'd like to have in your room. Also, right over here we have a whiteboard and a cork board. You can use your corkboard to tell your friends all about what you're doing on campus. So say you have this great event coming up, use this corkboard, put up a flyer, and hopefully your friends will come. We also have a whiteboard, really good for communication. Say you have a job interview and you don't want people to come into your room, you can write job interview one to three, please don't have to start. The first year quad has a lounge on every floor with whiteboards for studying, a fully equipped laundry room in each hall, and a music practice room. For ideas on what and what not to bring, be sure to check out our website, which has plenty of information. Welcome to the University of Rochester, and welcome home. All right, so you heard a little bit about some of our uh, staffing in that, but Ashlyn, maybe you can chime in and talk about who is in the first year halls and what their roles are. Absolutely, so we have a number of different staff who are in the halls there to support you. One thing that's unique about the University of Rochester is our team in the first year area specifically. So we have what's called a uh, DeLion, which is someone who is an upper class student who lives on the floor. And their role is to really get you connected to the campus community. So they will encourage um, school spirit, going to events on campus, just having that connection to the larger campus community. They work really closely with our first year fellows who are peer academics Court, which is right in the hall as well. So you will have a fellow who's an upper class student who lives um, in your hall as well. And that is in addition to a resident advisor who is your RA, who is someone who is going to be there for support, um, who's going to plan programs and events and just be a person that you can go to anytime that you have a question or you have a concern about living in the building. 
Additionally, there's more support system on the higher level. So we have graduate students, which are called graduate head residents, and they live in the buildings as well and are there to support the RAs as well as anything else that's going on in the building. They are supported by area coordinators who are master's level professionals across campus who are also here for campus emergency response. And then on top of that, we have other professional residents like staff who are always there and able to help students. We also have a really cool program called the EcoRep program, which is actually a something that you can get involved with as a first year student. So it's going to be one of the first opportunities for you to get involved in direct hall leadership on campus. And you will actually gain two credits from being an eco rep. So you'll take classes, learn about sustainability, get involved in leadership. And it's a really great way to connect to your peers and educate our greater campus community about sustainability. Thanks, Ashlyn. Trying to advance my slide here. Ah, there we go. So what are the spaces like? Students live in double, triple, and single rooms in the first year residence hall buildings. You saw pictures of them. All of the rooms are equipped with one of everything for everybody. So there's not a lot of need to share. If there's a triple room, there's three dressers, and there's three desks, and there's three chairs. So we absolutely make sure that everybody has one of everything. Uh, rooms are equipped with an Ethernet port. We see fewer and fewer students using them. We're so accustomed to Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi all over the place. The great news is we have Wi-Fi everywhere on campus, uh, and it's really fast. But if you're gaming or you're doing uh, some streaming in your room and you really want that super high-speed connection, you can plug right into the Ethernet port and get that. Single rooms do exist, but they're limited in number. There is a process. For any student who requires a single room as a disability accommodation, I'll tell you right now, Residential Life does not seek, uh, ask for, or receive any personal medical information. You can go to rochester.edu, type in disability, that will take you to the Disability Resources Office, and there's great information there about applying for a housing accommodation due to a disability. It could be a medical disability, a mental health disability, or a cognitive issue. Uh, all of your private and personal documentation will be sent directly to the Office of Disability Resources where they'll review it, they'll work with our health service and our counseling center, and they will simply get back to residential life with a recommendation and no personal or diagnostic information about you. We often receive uh, accommodation requests like this student requires a building with an elevator, this student requires a single room, this student requires access to a kitchen. So it could be any number of things. Uh, we do work very hard to meet whatever those accommodations are, but again, don't send any of your personal medical information to Residential Life. Always work through the Office of Disability Resources for that information. We have a variety of living styles. Julianne, is this you? You want to talk about living styles? Sure. Um, I'll pop the so, agenda, sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, so there's a few different living styles that um, students have options uh, to opt into. So one of which would be the all gender by random room. So um, this would mean that there's, um, it's not a single gender hallway. So you would be living amongst um, men, women, um, however people um, identify, but the, the bedrooms um, would be gendered unless if people specify um, uh, like accommodations with that. So there would be separate bathrooms um, for each gender. And in some areas, there are all gender um, restrooms available as well. So um, all gender by corridor, um, this is that the building is all gender, but the corridors are like a designated um, floor. So it would be a uh, single gender for, for specific floors, but uh, the rest of the building like would not be. Um, and so then there's the gender inclusive room. Um, so this would be, I mentioned this briefly already, but um, a double room for students who are gender non-conforming or for two students who are um, of different gender identities who elect to live together. So these are assignments that are made with both parties consenting. Um, and it would 
automatically be like those students would be assigned to a quarter that has an all gender restroom. Um, and then there's a few other options for first year students as well. We call these affinity style housing. And so keep in mind um, in the first year areas, it is substance free. Um, if you're not 21, you are not allowed to have alcohol. Um, and we are a tobacco smoke free campus. So you're not allowed to smoke on, on campus. But students who opt to live in the substance free housing, this would mean that they pledge that regardless of age, they are not going to be consuming um, alcohol or any like illegal substances. So this would be non prescribed um, uh, drugs and stuff. So they are looking to have a community where other people are also pledging that they're not going to be um, engaging in that behavior. So the same would be for the non smoking. Um, it would be um, so just because you yourself don't smoke, it doesn't mean that your roommate doesn't off campus and would bring the odor like coming back on you. So students who opt to live in the non smoking any housing, it's pledging that they and the others on their hall will not partake. Um, and then the third option is the quiet study option. So this is for students who would prefer to be housed in a community where others are committed to 24 seven courtesy hours. Um, and an increased number of quiet hours, um, which would be above the, the standard. So if they plan on studying in their room a lot. So with this, it's not guaranteed that the hall is going to be ultra quiet, like it's not going to be completely quiet, but it will be more quiet than like the average, the average hall. Thanks. Here's a little bit about what happens with assigning rooms. We saw somebody in the question, when, when can we apply for housing? So the admissions office wants to hear from you by May 1st, whether or not you're going to elect to attend the University of Rochester. Um, some of you have already made that decision and others of you are still weighing it. But we do need to know and admissions needs to know by May 1st if you're gonna be joining us. Actually, I think it's May 2nd this year because that's a Monday, but I will let the admissions folks clarify that. Uh, once you choose to attend the University of Rochester, you're gonna receive a link to my rock which is the admissions website that will have all of the information for enrolling students. That's when you're gonna receive your housing application and your dining application. Those are due June 1st for on-time consideration. There is no advantage to being early. So June 1st is when they're due and everybody who's submitted their contracts on time by June 1st will be considered on time. Late submissions after June 1st could result in a delayed assignment. A lot of that has to do with how many of you attend, choose to attend. We're hoping that we get 1,500 of you in the class of 2026. So we'll wait and see what that number looks like after May 2nd. We saw a slide earlier about eco reps. Look out for that eco rep information on my rock. And if you're really interested in sustainability and wanna commit to helping make our campus be more sustainable and the earth uh, a more sustainable place to live, think about applying to be an eco rep. It's a great opportunity to get involved early on in some leadership on campus. Room and roommate assignments are gonna be mailed out in mid-July with contact information. So how do we do these assignments? I'm gonna stop the share, it's my last slide. Come back to you and tell you a little bit about how we make room assignments. We ask you to give us your gender identity. We can't guess based on your name. So we do ask you to give your gender identity. We do ask you to let us know if you're interested living uh, on a single gender community or on what we used to call co-ed or now an all gender floor. Um, we ask you if you're interested in quiet study or substance-free or smoke-free housing. Those are the only questions that we ask you. Beyond that, roommate assignments are made randomly. And I will talk a little bit more about that process in a moment. If you know someone with whom you'd like to live, someone from your high school, maybe you're a twin. We've had siblings who have wanted to live together. We've also had siblings who have not wanted to live together. So if you do have somebody you wanna live with, somebody you know from camp, somebody who you met on an admissions trip, uh, somebody who's on your team, if you're an athlete, there's a place for you to indicate that on your housing application. And we do honor mutual roommate requests. Now, if I wanna live with my brother and my brother doesn't wanna live with me, 
we're not going to assign the two of us together. So always mutual requests we will honor, but uh, when they're not mutual, we don't match them up. I mentioned triples. We have triples, they're a way of life. Triple housing is not crowded housing. It's not special housing. We have triples every single year. Triple rooms are the largest spaces in first year housing, which are actually the largest rooms anywhere on campus. There's plenty of room for three people to live together happily. You can check on your housing application that you would like to live in a triple room. You can indicate on your housing application that there's two roommates who you would like to live with. And if they also indicate that they'd like to live with you, we'll assign the three of you to a triple room. Advantages to a triple room. There is a 20% discount off of the cost of housing for students who live in a triple room. That discount has zero impact on your financial aid package. So for some families, that's an extra assistance. 20% uh, off the cost of housing without affecting your financial aid package. We will fill many of our triple rooms with students who do request to live in triple rooms. We may not be able to fill them all with students who request to live in triple rooms. And so if you're late and you don't make the June 1st deadline for submitting your housing contract, you may be assigned to a triple room. If our class size comes in very large and you're on time by the June 1st deadline, you still might get assigned to a triple room. But again, the first priority goes to people who request to live in a triple room. The next round would go to people who missed the deadline to apply on time. And occasionally there are on-time students who don't specifically request a triple room who might be assigned to a triple room. We find that students get along very well. Uh, we start the year intentionally bringing students together to talk to one another. Ashlyn talked about the RAs, the DeLions, and the first year fellows who live on the floors. Those are upper class students. On the first day that you arrive, that night, you'll have a hall meeting. And your RA, your DeLion, and your fellow will begin working with you and your roommate or your roommates on a living agreement. It's about 35 questions. And we go through them one at a time with the roommates. And we talk about leaving the window open or leaving the window closed, or I'm messy, or I'm neat, or I have to take the trash out twice a day, or I never take the trash out, or you can borrow my toothpaste and I don't like it when you borrow anything. All of those questions that you don't wanna be the awkward person to raise the question, we raise them for you. And all students who live together do begin the year with a living agreement. The RAs, the DeLions and the fellows re revisit that living agreement a few weeks into the semester. When students don't get along living together, my staff, the RAs, the graduate head residents, and the area coordinators will work with them. They will attempt to mediate the roommate conflict, but sometimes it just doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, we absolutely have a process in place for uh, room changes. So we're happy to do that. You will engage on the class of 2026 Facebook page. So I know a lot of you are done with Facebook, but get on that class Facebook page because a lot of you are gonna meet each other and match each other on the Facebook page. And you'll turn in a housing application indicating each other as a preferred roommate. You're welcome to do that. You are absolutely welcome to do that, but we don't do any 100 or 200 questionnaire um, survey to match roommates. There's actually been some research done in the field of housing and residential life, taking a look at that. And the reality is, there's no difference in the roommate outcomes. And in fact, they can be a little bit more difficult with heavy duty matching because the expectations are very high that you're gonna be a perfect match. So we address it on the day you move in and we address it by beginning to ask, um, have you talked to each other and ask each other questions about how you like to live together. Julianne and Ashlyn, anything I missed? Um. So someone did ask in the chat um, if the quiet study, non-smoking floors, uh, quiet study, 
if they are attached to specific buildings. Um, I wasn't sure if Lovejoy is going to have that next year. So if you could- Yeah, they are. And um, I can tell you that I believe the smoke-free housing is in Lovejoy. Ashlyn, you remember from we did the RA placements. I think smoke-free is in Lovejoy, substance-free and quiet study are in Susan B. Anthony. And then someone else asked, and I couldn't remember, for the cork board and whiteboard, we saw that in the quad. Um, do Sue B and Genesee have it? I know they have a whiteboard, but I Absolutely. Sure yep. Work. We have those cork boards and whiteboards in all the residence halls. And I do see a question about do early decision students get first pick on dorms? Uh, nope, they do not. So on time is on time. Get your stuff turned in on time. And we will do our best to uh, make sure we match you with a good roommate and a great room. Single rooms are indeed in the first year residence halls. They're up and down the floors in the same halls. There are single rooms in Susan B. Anthony, in Hoeing, in Gilbert, in Tiernan, in Genesee, and Lovejoy. So every single one of our buildings has um, single rooms. In fact, every building except for Susan B. Anthony has double, single, and triple rooms. Susan B. Anthony does not have any triple rooms. We tried to arrange three sets of furniture in a Susan B. Anthony room, and we can't make it work. So there are no triples in Susan B. Anthony. Um, someone else asked if every hall has a kitchen. There is a kitchen on every single floor in first year housing. Oh, you know what, I take that back. There is a kitchen for the building in Genesee Hall, but in um, the first year quad buildings in Susan B. Anthony, there's a, a kitchen on every floor and students are welcome to bring some basic cooking equipment for their rooms. Really, you can only use a microwave in your room. You can have a small refrigerator freezer and a microwave. Um, you, there's things that you can bring. If you look on our website, there's a what to pack list that talks about what to bring and what you can and can't bring. You can bring a rice cooker. You're supposed to use the rice cooker in the kitchen. So that's a good example. We do want you to use any heat generating appliances in the kitchen itself, but you can have a microwave in your room. If you're a student living in the Rochester area, can you live on campus for one year and commute for three? So every year we have about 100 students from the Rochester area. And every year we have about nine of them, nine to 11, who choose to live at home. So even students from Rochester, most of our students from Rochester are indeed choosing to live on campus. And they do live on campus for both years. Students who do live locally with their immediate family are exempt from our requirements. So a first year student could choose to live on campus for their first year and then choose to move home um, for their sophomore year. You would not be permitted to move to an off-campus apartment for your sophomore year, but we would release you from your contract if you were gonna go move at home. Julianne's uh, answering a question about bedding. Um, I apologize in our slideshow, the video um, deleted our staffing slide. So I'm really glad that Ashlyn talked about the staff. Uh, we didn't have that visual aid and I apologize for that. It, it's really important to know how well our staffs, our, our halls are staffed. I mean, there's an RA for just about every 28 first year students. So you've got an RA, highly competitive position. Every year we have well over 150 students applying for maybe about 50 openings for the upcoming year. It's very competitive. They're terrific student leaders. There's a grade point requirement to become an RA and they're really, really engaged. They get to know each and every person who lives on their floor and they're very, very well trained with lots of campus resources and information. I don't have to tell you that. Every campus in this country has an RA. So you know what RAs are, they're terrific. Many of you parents may have been RAs when you were in college. Unique to the University of Rochester is the Delion and the first year fellow. Delion is short for Dandelion. Our Delions are rah-rah, they are spirit. They remember your birthday. They're volunteers. The Delions are a club and they live on first year floors 
And if you've got a woman on your hall who plays on the field hockey team, it's the Delion who's going to grab everybody and get them together and drag you out to the field hockey game to cheer her on. So Delions are a lot of fun and they're absolutely unique to the University of Rochester. First year fellows are uh, academic coaches and peer tutors. Um, they live one on every floor in our first year communities. They help you navigate the Rochester curriculum. Um, they help you understand all of the academic processes that come along, whether it's registration or the drop ad period or the satisfactory fail option or all those other things. They can talk to you about clusters and majors and writing classes. So putting the Delion and the first year fellow in the hall, in the first year halls, along with an RA, really lets us have a wraparound experience of upper class peer leadership helping you navigate your first year. We're pretty proud of it. Um, Dan, can you talk a bit about um, if students can live on campus for all four years? Yeah, so we don't explicitly guarantee housing for all four years. I can tell you that for many years, all students who wanted to be able to live on campus have been able to live on campus. So while it's not a guarantee, there's quite a lot of opportunity for students to live on campus if they wish to do so. After the first year, we have quite a variety of housing stocks. So we continue to have double and single rooms in traditional residence halls on corridors, but we also have six person suites and four person apartments and three person apartments and two person apartments and one person apartments. We only have a few of those, but we do have some. We have fraternity houses. We have special interest living areas. We have the Douglas Leadership House that takes a look at leadership from an African and African-American perspective. We have the Drama House for students who are interested in drama and improv on campus, the Music Interest Floor, the Anime Living Center, the House of Marcia, which is a community dedicated to the LGBTQI experience uh, and history. So lots and lots of choices after the first year, and many students do indeed find the ability to live on campus for all four years. Again, senior year, we're about 65% of our students living on campus, but most of those students who are living off campus are living off campus by their choice and not by force. Um, not a guarantee, but a likelihood that for students who do want to live on campus, we have been able to offer them housing. Thank you. Um, so there's a few questions about beds, bed height, and if you need to request a longer bed. Sure. If you visit our website, which is rochester.edu slash reslife, uh, you can click on our area handbook. So if you go to first year housing, you could go to either the first year quad or the first year hill and click on those areas and their handbooks. Our bed heights are adjustable to one, two, and three. One is almost on the floor. Two is mm, like a couple of feet above the floor. And three is about three and a half feet above the floor. And the dresser, as you, Shri showed you in the video, fits nicely underneath and it creates some floor space. So those are the standard twin bed heights. You can also request to have your bed lofted. And if it's lofted, it's about five feet up in the air. Uh, we'll come to your room and do that for you. Please don't bring homemade lofting kits. You're not allowed to have them, but we will loft your bed for you. Um, and if you do loft to up, up to about five feet up in the air, your dresser and your desk will both fit underneath the bed creating even more floor space. Finally, we can bunk the beds. We can have two beds assembled to be traditional bunks. We receive virtually no requests for that. We can do it, but I think the roommates argue over who gets the top bunk and who gets the bottom bunk. I don't know. We don't see much interest in bunking, but lots of lofting, happy to do it. And our, um, much like most campuses around the country, our beds are twin extra long. And when back to school time comes around, whether you go to Walmart or Target or Penny, Penny's or Macy's or you shop on Amazon, they'll have all kinds of back to school specials and they will all sell twin extra long sheets and comforters. It's pretty standard at colleges and universities, twin extra long. Can I repeat which buildings are smoke free and substance free? They're not buildings, they're floors. So the entire campus is smoke free since 2017, but for smoke free living, uh, we have a smoke-free living community in Lovejoy Hall. We have substance-free living communities in Susan B. Anthony, and we have 
quiet study living communities in Susan B. Anthony, but these are just floors in those buildings. They're not the entire building. Any more questions? This is an awfully easy crowd. Last week's crowd had a lot more questions. Please visit our website. Lots of questions can be answered there. And again, clicking through to the first year living program and reading about the first year hill and the first year quad will give you lots of insight in terms of what the amenities are in those areas. We have a really wonderful leadership program. We have leadership ambassadors in each building. They are what, again, parents or, or those of you who have older brothers and sisters who went to college, you may have heard of hall councils or student government. We have leadership ambassadors in our residence halls and the leadership ambassadors make something called the Residence Hall Association, RHA. RHA is a national program and we are an RHA campus lots and lots of opportunities for leadership and student government, whether it's the Students Association in the Senate or you join RHA as a leadership ambassador, great ways to get involved and make a difference in your community. Um, good question from a mom about does the campus require masks and if so, how does it impact the dorms? Uh, we suspended our mask requirement and a few weeks ago we brought it back. So we are currently requiring masks and all indoor locations on campus, uh, including in the residence hall, students are not required to mask in their own room or their own apartment. So you can kind of come home at the end of the day and take your mask off and hang out with your roommate. Um, but yeah, we are currently masking again. We did have a, a couple of lovely months of fresh air when the masks came off, but we went back to a mask mandate, I think, about two weeks ago. The question about which social media app students use to find roommates, uh, it's largely Facebook. So formally speaking, the admissions office will, will uh, have a class of 2026 Facebook page. Once you get here and get settled, admissions takes that Facebook page and hands it over to the class council. And so the 2026 class council will hang on to that Facebook page and manage it for four years until you graduate, at which time the class council will hand that Facebook page over to the alumni office and the alumni office will manage it. So formally speaking, it is indeed the class of 2026 Facebook page. I know that lots of other students meet each other on Instagram. It's not formal, but people can join the U of R Instagram page. They can join the class Facebook page and say, hey, I'm looking for a roommate. I like this kind of music, I like this kind of food, and sometimes people do find each other that way, but on the Facebook page, it's a little bit more structured. Uh, transportation. We are very close to the airport. Um, planes fly, fly over all the time. Uh, we are probably less than four miles from the Rochester airport, and there are cabs and Ubers easily accessible and cheap. So lots of cabs, Ubers, lifts, back and forth for international students who will be arriving on, I believe, Monday, August 22nd. Our International Services Office will be running airport shuttles. You're going to get lots of information over the summer to register your arrival, and they will be at the airport meeting people um, and helping them get back to campus. Um, Dan, can you talk a bit about resources for students who are going to be living off campus um, and if an uh, undergraduate student is a parent? Oh, yeah. So, all right. I was going to mention this uh, in the previous question about four-year housing. So the Office for Residential Life and Housing Services really takes a, a lot of care regarding students' housing, whether they live on campus or off. So we run an off-campus living program right here out of the Res Life office. We have an, one of our assistant directors is responsible for the off-campus living program. She, uh, if you again visit our website and click on off-campus, it'll give you a lot of information on the off-campus living program. 
we run a listing service called Places for Students. Um, it's a third party uh, apartment listing service, but we sort of vet them and work closely with them to give our students access. Becca is the off-campus coordinator and she works with both tenants and landlords. So our landlords get a lot of training about what it's like to have college students living with you. And our students get a lot of information about what it's like to live in the community and set up your electricity and your water and pay your bills and all those things that you have to do when you live off campus. So we do offer a lot of resources for our off-campus students, both in finding a place to live and in supporting you when you do live off campus. I think I, you said, what about somebody who's got a kid? So um, anybody who is coming to the university who may have a dependent child with them, you should reach out to our office. We have something called graduate and family housing. It is you know, 90% or more, um, probably 99% graduate students, but we would open that option up to an undergraduate student who was married and or had children. Um, and if that wasn't something that made sense, we would make sure that you could work with our off-campus living program to identify a rental property. But uh, married students and students with dependent children don't live in the undergraduate residence halls. Thanks, Dan. Um, can you also talk a little bit about the housing lottery for when they become upperclassmen? Yeah, we're in it right now. Today is the last day of the housing lottery. So students have all been busy, busy picking their rooms for next year. Um, the housing lottery is roughly based on class year. Um, all of the rising juniors and seniors will be considered upper class next year and they will submit their housing applications and they will be given a random time to select their room. Um, on the first day, they can, I told you before, we have lots of six person suites and four person apartments. So often our upper class students will get together as a group of six because uh, they wanna live in a suite together. Whichever one of those six has the best lottery time, we'll pick. So the earliest lottery time, you know, early is better because as rooms start to get picked, there's less and less choice. So the person with the best time will pick and pull in the other five students with them. That will then void their lottery time. So once you've been selected, you're done. So if, if, uh, if I pull in my five friends who've all previously agreed to be in this group of six, um, they know that whoever does make the selection will pull them all in. The first things to go will be some of those singles or single apartments pretty quickly. Um, uh, but after that, uh, students really like the self-contained apartments, which have kitchens and living rooms, uh, Brooks Crossing and Riverview, also South Side apartments that have kitchens. And then finally, it tends to the rising sophomores um, will often still be able to get rooms in the six person groups and in the doubles and singles around campus. So only just a little bit more than half of our students ultimately participate in the lottery because the people who don't participate in the lottery have already been placed because they got hired to be an RA, they got selected to be a first year fellow or a DeLion, they're living with a fraternity or a sorority, They've joined the Douglas Leadership House. They live on the music interest floor. All of those special programs, you all get assigned to your housing before it even comes time to pick. So it's just about half of our upper class students on the back end that do go into the lottery to make the room selection because they're not already affiliated with a housing program. How does the furniture differ from Genesee and the other buildings? Yeah, Genesee is a, a, a metal frame furniture uh, with a wooden headboard and, and flipboard. Um, and the others are all oak. It had to do with when we pur purchased the buildings and furnished, but it's, it's generally very good furniture that we keep in great condition and we replace as needed. The Genesee furniture can also be um, raised and lowered and uh, lofted. Um, it's a slightly different style. In Susan B. Anthony and the first year quad, it's all oak furniture. Uh, in Genesee, it's, it's laminate and metal, but it's 
It's good. The mattresses are the same everywhere. A lot of people ask us if they should try to get into the quad or sous B. And I have to tell you, um, the people in the quad uh, love living in the quad and they're very angry at us for taking Lovejoy over to make Lovejoy a first year building because that was their chance. If they lived in, if they lived in the quad in the first year, uh, they could still hope to live in Lovejoy for their second year, but we've taken Lovejoy over as first year housing. So the quad people swear by the quad, love the quad. The Susan B. Anthony people would never want to live anywhere else. Can you imagine living in a building with 630 of your closest friends uh, and having a dining room and a convenience store in the lobby that you don't have to put a winter coat on for, and you can even go to breakfast in your slippers. So Sue B students love Sue B. They swear by it, and they've always, of course, been angry because Sue B has always been first year housing, so there's never been a chance for them to live in Sue B in their sophomore year unless they get hired to be a, a fellow or a DeLion or an RA. But I think students are very happy um, with what they can do. Can we paint the walls? No, you can't alter the room. Uh, we do have lots of opportunity for you to hang art and we do have um, mounting strips available so you can pin things and, and put them up, but nope, you can't paint. So that's a fair question. Apologies if we covered this. What percentage of upper class students live off campus? Uh, we got to do the math here. So 80% of our students live on campus, which means about 20% live off campus. And uh, virtually, you know, single digits of first year and sophomore students, a very small handful of students who happen to be from Rochester in the junior year. 70 or so percent, 75 percent of our students live on campus, so maybe a quarter of the junior class, some of them being abroad junior year, and by senior year we're at about 65 percent, so 35 percent of the seniors uh, will choose to live off campus. Ashlyn, you want to talk about quiet hours? Sure, um, we do have quiet hours. They're a little bit later on the weekends than they are during the week. We like to say that every hour is a courtesy hour, so you shouldn't be making so much noise that it's going to be disruptive to your neighbors. Um, but we do only enforce quiet hours after the set quiet hour time. We do have 24 hour a day quiet hours during finals week. So during um, finals and when people are really trying to study for exams, those quiet hours are enforced 24 hours a day. Um, but the quiet hours on the weekend, I believe, are at 1, 1 a.m. So it's it's later on the weekend than it is during the weekdays when we know people are trying to study and go to sleep to get ready for class. Julianne, anything else out there? Nope. Oh, wait. Um, can you talk a bit about uh, pest control, DHS? Pest control, our number one asset in pest control is you. So we take pride in our buildings and our maintenance and facility staff who do a great job cleaning our buildings, pests, and in particular, you may have heard of mice, uh, they like food. And we work closely with students and encourage them, <laughs> take your trash out. You don't have to take it out. You only have to take it down the hall to the trash room. Um, don't leave a lot of snack food around. Don't leave a big bag of popcorn sitting around. When the weather turns cold, sometimes some of the mice who live on our campus can find their way into the residence halls. And if you have food, they will find that food. We can call in uh, a report to pest control um, seven days a week. And they typically, if it's during business hours, pest control will respond the same day. Um, if it is after hours or on the weekend, they'll respond the first chance they get. They will um, set traps and bait. They will help. They'll talk to you about not leaving your food out. They'll, talk, they'll take a look to make sure that there's no access points. Um, we have door sweeps on the bottom of our room doors. And if a door sweep has come loose, they'll make sure the facility staff comes out to replace the door sweep. But in places where we've seen an uptick in pests, 
Um, it typically has to do with either there's a lot of snack food lying around that's not in a plastic bin, or everybody in the suite thinks that somebody else in the suite called it in, and it turns out that nobody called it in. So our number one asset with pest control is working with the students who live with us and asking you, please just call. We're not gonna charge you for the exterminator to come. It's, it's all included. We're all here for you. We wanna keep it clean, um, but we really need your help in doing so. But we do have environmental health and safety on campus does have full-time pest control for the entire campus. So they come right out and, and help you out the moment they're aware of an issue happening. But we have to come up with something better than that to end on. Anything? Um, there's a question about what happens if um, a student violates the mask policy. So maybe if you uh, talk about the conduct process in general too. Do, do one of you want to talk about it? You're much closer to it than I am. I mean, I can answer the question, but yeah, Juliana um, and Ashlyn sure. work with this all the time. <laughs> so our our conduct process is designed to be an educational restorative process. So while sometimes there may be like punitive action that takes place, the the whole model is supposed to be harm reduction, um, educating to make sure that people understand why the policy exists, and to try to really discourage like repeat like um, offenses of the policy. Because usually people are not violating the policy out of like malice. There's usually an underlining um, reason why someone might be breaking a rule. Um, and so for something like the mask policy, while it's serious because we care about our community health, the initial violation um, it it may vary. Um, if your mask uh, you know fell below your nose or you dropped it outside. The first time an RA sees you, it might be a verbal warning of like, hey, remember to like wear your mask. And then say if you know the RA notices again, you're not wearing your mask, they, they might give you another verbal warning, um, but they might document you. And so in that case, you might get an informal letter of warning from the area coordinator reminding you that the policy exists. If there's another violation, then you might have to meet with the area coordinator. And then if there's another violation, it will just continue to escalate. Um, I've found that usually people don't really violate past, once they have to meet with the area coordinator that usually puts a stop to it because that's pretty inconvenient for, for them. But then the policy also gets like further explained. But um, I, I would say it's on the lower end of the violations, but it can definitely like add up to be more serious. But you're not going to be suspended for not wearing your mask uh, one time. So don't, don't worry about that. Um. Somebody wants to know about our tunnels. You know about our famous tunnels. Uh, the tunnels connect all of the buildings on the Eastman Quad, and there are no residence halls on the Eastman Quad. So, um, no, the residence halls are not connected to the academic parts of campus by tunnel. Hill Court, where many of our upper class students live, about six, seven hundred people live in Hill Court. Um, Hill Court is is six buildings together in one complex. Our students call it bays. So for those of you who've been here, you might've heard of phase. The six Hillcourt buildings are connected to one another under a tunnel. So if you live in Kendrick, you can easily go to Monroe by going down to the basement in the hallway and back up. But in general, the residence halls are not connected to the rest of the campus by tunnel. And most of the campus is not connected to itself through tunnels. It's just the Eastman Quad and the Rushery's Library. And it sure is convenient, but no, it is not a campus-wide tunnel system. Um, and a bathroom question. This is always a good question. We provide service uh, six days a week. Um, we pull trash and clean bathrooms five days a week, every single bathroom in the first year residence halls in the corridor style buildings. Um, five days a week, every single bathroom is cleaned every single day and checked at the end of the shift before the uh, ESWs, environmental service workers, before they leave for the day. So cleaned once a day and eyes on a second time. On weekends, there's a, a check and clean as needed. Um, and then on Sunday, there is no service. But if there's a problem, um, we have a 24 hour call in. So if ever there was a problem or a mess or something needed, we can, we can call campus facilities um, 
seven days a week and they'll respond. And who has access? The great question. Now you're given the questions. All right. So uh, the university ID, the U of R one card, it's your meal plan, it's your library card, it's your key to get in and out of the residence halls. So no matter where you live on campus, you can visit anywhere else on campus all day long. At 1 a.m., it shifts to your card will only let you into the building where you live. So during the day, uh, you can visit your friends in other residence halls and they can come and visit you, but only on campus students. Off campus students have to come in and make a special request to get ID access to the residence halls. And there's washers and dryers in every single building. Uh, and that is included in the cost of housing. So moms and dads may remember scrounging and saving quarters and trying to get change to do laundry. Not an issue here. We do ask students to use their ID to swipe and that ID swipe will allow them to use the washers and dryers. The only reason we have an ID swipe is because we don't want people who aren't students to be getting free laundry. But yep, every single building, you do not have to go outside with your laundry basket. There's two laundry rooms in Susan B. Anthony and one in every other building. I think that's it. That's a good question to end on is laundry and keeping clean. Moms and dads, please remind and please remind yourselves and teach your sons and daughters how to do their laundry. That's one of the most fun things that first year RAs do in the first week is figure out who's wearing the pink t-shirt and washed it with their red sock. Um, and then they help them with some laundry tips. So teach them how to do laundry. They will thank you for it. Any other questions, please refer to our website. You can contact any of us through the website um, or through your admissions counselor, and they'll reach back out to us with any questions that you have. Thanks so much for your time this afternoon. Thank you, Julianne and Ashlyn. And we hope to see a lot of you in August.